In this video, we will discuss the basics of thermodynamics, specifically focusing on heat and entropy. Okay, but before we get to heat, we're going to first review some basics about chemical bonds. Um, so, energy is stored in chemical bonds, that's important to know, and um, when you break a bond, that's going to require energy. Okay, and... Um, We've seen pictures like this before where we say, okay, um, this is the ideal bond length. Because it releases the most energy, specifically 100 kilojoules per mole. And if we push our atoms in their uh, nuclei too close together... then that's going to be unstable. They're going to be too close together. And then if they're not close enough, then the atoms uh, can't really interact. And so we would say that over here, atoms are too far away. But this is the ideal bond length, okay? So uh, that bond length, whatever unit this is, I don't know because I did not label it on the x-axis, but that's about, what, 3.7 maybe, uh, whatever the unit is. Now, um, if we remember from the gases unit, we see these Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions, and what it's saying is that uh, heavier, and actually I'm going to erase that, I'm going to say more scientifically, more massive, literally more mass, more massive molecules move slower. Okay, so oxygen here has a molar mass of 32.00 grams per mole, where hydrogen, and also remember, we this is an average, so I generally like to look at the top, uh, the peak of our graph, because that's where most of the molecules will be. Um, oxygen, 32.00 grams per mole, and then hydrogen is 2.02 uh, .02 grams per mole. And so it makes sense that hydrogen is traveling a lot faster about, at about maybe 1,700 meters per second, where oxygen's only going about 300 meters per second. Um, but what is important is that atoms or molecules, whatever you're dealing with, at the same temperature, have the same kinetic energy. So both oxygen and hydrogen, they're at 298 Kelvin. And because kinetic energy equals one half mass times velocity squared for oxygen, the mass is really high, but the velocity is really low to get the kinetic energy. But if I change that to hydrogen, Hydrogen moves really fast, but it's not very massive. And so whatever those numbers may be, when you multiply them together with this formula, square the velocity and one half the mass, you will get the same kinetic energy for these gases. Okay, so that is, that is important to know. Okay, so we have seen that uh, different chemical processes... Um, can be endothermic or exothermic. If heat is absorbed by your system, that's what you're studying, then that's going to be an endothermic process. And if heat is lost or released by the system, that's going to be an exothermic process. And I kind of think about it as um, a bank account. You know, if I take in money or I absorb money into my bank account, then my bank account is going to show me with that money being positive or green. Um, and then if I take out money, um, or release that money when I pay bills or whatnot, then that money comes out as red or negative. Um, and so that would be like Q being negative if I gain or lose, uh, Q being negative if I lose heat, and then Q being positive if I gain heat. And uh, Q is just heat in joules. But we'll commonly see enthalpy, which is delta H or the change in heat, And that's going to be referred to uh, Q divided by your moles, okay? 
Um, so let's see how this would work. First of all, I want to know how to write this in a reaction because we're going to do some thermodynamic stoichiometry. So I want to know which side of the reaction things go on. If my delta H is negative, then what that means is I've got my um, reactants over here. And heat is going out of the system or being produced. And so these will be my products. And so the negative just tells me what side of the reaction. So if I have, I'll do this um, last one here. I have calcium solid plus oxygen gas plus hydrogen gas. That'll go to calcium hydroxide solid. And then since I'm losing heat, that means heat will be over here. So this will be plus 986 kilojoules uh, per mole. And it's actually moles of reaction. We'll see where that comes into play in just a minute. Okay, so if I have the decomposition of ammonia here into its elements, that'll be NH3, just breaking apart into N2 plus H2, those diatomic elements. And to get those balanced, I'll put a 3 there and then a 2 there. And it looks like for this decomposition reaction to occur, I've got to absorb some heat, so that'll be plus 46.1 kilojoules per mole of reaction. Okay, so that's where that'll be written. We can see this in some stoichiometry pretty nicely, actually. Um, and in this question number two, I have 25 grams of iron and unlimited amounts of oxygen. That means oxygen is my excess reactant and iron is my limiting reactant. And I want to know how many or how much heat in kilojoules is produced from this reaction. Well, of course, the first thing I need to do is balance it. And then it looks like I'm losing heat. So I'm going to say plus 1644.4 kilojoules per mole of reaction. And I'm going to start out with 25.0 grams of Fe as a reminder from uh, just stoichiometry from regular chemistry, first get this to moles. According to the periodic table, there's 55.85 grams of Fe in one mole of Fe. And now this is where it's a little bit weird. Normally with stoichiometry, we would mole bridge and we go from let's say iron to iron oxide. And so here's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go from four moles of Fe, but I'm going to convert it to actually the heat. Four moles of Fe would produce 1644.4 kilojoules. Okay, and when I math that out, I get 736 kilojoules. And there's a couple ways to do this. We could say negative kilojoules, and the negative tells me that it's being produced. Or I could just say 736 kilojoules produced. Okay, so either is fine. And that is how we do thermodynamic stoichiometry. So if I move on to maybe one that's a limiting reactant problem, here we've got 28.02 grams of nitrogen, and it's going to try and react with 212.7 grams of chlorine. And I want to know how much heat is absorbed in this process. So if you look here, the heat is positive, so we'll say plus 85 kilojoules per mole of reaction. Um, there's a couple steps to do limiting reactants. I know this is a limiting reactant problem because I'm given nitrogen and I'm given chlorine and I don't know which one to start my conversion with. So the way I do limiting reactants is first step I say get moles and so 28.02 grams of nitrogen there is actually 28.02 grams of nitrogen in one mole of nitrogen. So right now I'm sitting at one mole of nitrogen. And then for chlorine, I'm going to say there's um, 212.7 grams of Cl2. 
The molar mass of Cl2, according to my periodic table, is 79 or 70.90 grams of Cl2 in one mole of Cl2. And so I actually get three moles of Cl2. The next step would be divide by their respective coefficients. So divide by coefficient. So nitrogen would be 1.000 moles of N2. Chlorine would be 3 moles of Cl2. I'm going to divide them by their coefficients. So divide by 1, that equals 1. Divide by 3, that equals 1. And so normally what we would see is that the lowest number that we get would be our limiting reactant. But here they are actually the same. So this is a very strange situation, but actually both nitrogen and chlorine run out at the same time so they're both limiting and that is very uncommon limiting so i'm going to just use nitrogen to do my conversion with um, but i can prove that it'll actually be the same I'll, I'll just go ahead and actually do both i'll say one mole of nitrogen and i'm trying to convert to my heat so my mole bridge is one mole of nitrogen is 85 kilojoules. So one mole of nitrogen is actually 85 kilojoules. And so when I math that out, I get 85 kilojoules that is consumed. Or I could just put a plus there and get rid of the consumed. Either is fine. And then let me just prove that they're both going to be the same if I have three moles of Cl2 and of course I need to use the blue uh, moles of Cl2 because that's how many I actually had in my reaction. According to my reaction there are 3 moles of Cl2 to 85 kilojoules and so 3 divided by 3 is 1 times 85 that'll be 85 kilojoules consumed. Okay, now moving on to entropy. The second law of uh, thermodynamics basically says that if you have a process and it's spontaneous in one direction, then it's not going to be spontaneous in the reverse direction. For example, if I have a giant crystal ball and if I let go of it and I'm on, let's just say, ceramic floor and I let it go, it's going to fall and it's going to spontaneously crack into a whole bunch of pieces. The reverse process of all those pieces coming together and coming back up into my hands and to form a crystal ball, that's going to be non-spontaneous. Okay, so basically, if A goes to B as my process, if that is, let's just say that's non-spawn or non-spontaneous, then B going to A is or actually let's say must be spontaneous okay it's either one or the other and one thing that impacts that is whether or not it's an endothermic or exothermic process that's that's definitely important but another process is something called entropy and entropy is just the measure of disorder of a system so if I have positive entropy or change in disorder, then that means I have gained disorder. And that's actually very favorable, okay? It's very easy to turn something that's very ordered and make it disordered, okay? That's good to know. And then um, negative delta S, that means you lose disorder which that is going to be unfavorable think about your room at home it's very unlikely that you come home one day and you left your room messy that you just come home and it's automatically cleaned or very ordered that would be unfavorable okay and in notes uh two or three we're going to go through exactly how to relate entropy and uh, or delta S and delta H. So we can look at processes and know what their entropy is. So for example, we have solids, liquids, 
and we have gases. And gases are very disordered. Okay, they're bouncing around off walls and um, into each other all the time, where solids are very ordered. Okay, and so if something's very ordered, that means we have low entropy. We don't have very much disorder. But if we have uh, a lot of disorder, or we're very disordered, that would be high entropy. Okay, so basically solids have very low entropy and gases have very high entropy. Um, and larger molecules also have more entropy. So for example, if we compare calcium chloride with uh, KCl, if we look at their atomic size, um, calcium chloride has two more chlorines, so it'll... Uh, have more entropy. And then also, if we look at this hydrocarbon, it's a little bit bigger or longer than this other one. Um, and so therefore, it's going to have more entropy. So this will be more, we could say entropic. And then this would also be more entropic. So what I want to do is I want to look at a reaction and um, I want to be able to predict what the delta S will be. I'm going to give you the third law of thermodynamics. Um, and what that is, is just that the entropy of something like a pure crystal at zero Kelvin, where there's no movement, um, that because it has no movement, it would be called uh, an entropy of zero because it is perfectly ordered because it's not moving at all. So looking here at A, we're going from liquid water to gaseous water. So liquid to gas, gases have more uh, disorder. So delta S here would be positive. Here we're going from aqueous things that are moving around, bumping into each other to solid things. Um, and also we're going from two moles to one mole. And so what I know then is that we're gaining order or we're losing disorder. It's actually becoming more ordered. So delta S, we're losing disorder. That means it's gotta be negative. Here we're going from solid gas to solid. And so because we're just going from gas to solid, I know there's another solid over here, but this uh, right-hand side is all solid. That must mean that we're losing disorder. So delta S is actually gonna be negative. And here we're going from two gas moles to two gas moles. And so delta S is actually gonna be a pretty much zero because both sides have the same number of gas particles. Okay, we can keep it going if we're comparing uh, NaCl versus HCl. Um, NaCl solid versus gas, and we wanna know which has the greater entropy and to explain why using just a word or phrase. So I'd circle this, it's a gas. So I would say gases are more disordered Then solids. Okay, looking here, they're both gases, so I can't use the state of matter. But what I can say is that this has more. So that's just like more stuff, more particles equals more potential for disorder. Okay, and then if I have HCl versus argon, um, chlorine and argon are similar-ish in size, they're in the same energy level, but HCl has a hydrogen, so that molecule is just going to be larger than an argon atom, and so um, larger molecules are more disordered. Okay, so last question is um, I got to predict again with this process. If I take solids, sugar, and I dissolve it in water to form a solution, that means aqueous. If I'm going from solid to aqueous, delta S is going to be positive, and that's because I'm becoming more uh, disordered. And then if I condense something, vapor means gas, and if I condense it, it's going to the liquid phase. So liquids are much more... Uh, or gases are much more disordered and liquids 
are less disordered, so because I'm losing disorder, delta S will be negative there.